you don't have to look very far to know that the world is in great hurt, right? Uh, look at the news, look at, the, uh, at all of the uh, floods and the cold weather and everything, war in various places in the world. The world is in a world of hurt. To start with here, this, after, this morning, I would like to read a, a little statement from Our High Calling, page 11. It isn't only the world that's in hurt, but somebody else is hurting too. Let's look at it. Those who think of the hastening or hindering of the gospel often think of it in relation to themselves. Few think of its relationship to God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our Creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but the suffering did not end with his humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that, it's, that from its inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. Now this is why we <clears throat> should be praying for the second coming. To release Jesus, right? He's our high priest and he's our sin bearer in heavenly places. For Jesus' sake, in other words. Often we close our prayers that way, right? For Jesus' sake. It's for the sake of him. <clears throat> because the suffering of Jesus did not begin or end at the cross. He still carries the burdens of the sins of the world. You know, <clears throat> a couple of places in the book of John, it talks about the idea that Jesus wept. At Lazarus' resurrection, Jesus wept. People that were in the audience, they said, wow, he loved him. He loved Lazarus. And as he's standing in the city, looking over on the hill, overlooking the city, he uh, knew that that weekend was going to be a very treacherous one for himself, but also for all the people around. And he wept for those people. Jesus wept. This is the meaning of Hebrews 9, verse 12. He ministers, it says, with his own blood. right up into the close of human probation. And then Michael will stand up and deliver his people out of a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Some who do not have such an exalted view of Christ's sufferings and the truth about this come to the cross and maybe long for the, for the second coming because they're tired of lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or maybe they've got bad teeth. Or uh, maybe they don't have the ability to pay their, their uh, property taxes or something like that. That's not the reason why we should be looking for the second coming. That's kind of selfish, isn't it? When we realize that we have a Savior in heavenly places who still, still feels the feelings of our infirmities and weeps for humanity. You know, in John 17, there's a prayer. And Jesus prays for us. Don't you like that? Jesus prays for us. These things are not the reason to pray for the second coming that we might be relieved from some of these problems. But Jesus continues to hurt because of the guilt of human sin. For the hurts of his people, the Bible says, Jesus hurts. Continuing to hurt for our neighbors, our friends, our children. Yes, even for those that we might think are our enemies. Yes, while we were enemies, Christ died for the ungodly. He hurts for all people everywhere. And the whole nature groans. If we cannot resonate to that motive, for Jesus' sake, they then we may not yet be ready to receive the kingdom of heaven physically. And not ready to give the final message to the world. There somewhere in the days ahead, Somewhere in the days ahead, great attention of the world will be focused upon God's church. We know that's going to happen. But God will not bring that day about until there's something worth looking at, right? <laughs> Are we there yet? I used to have small children. We go on a vacation and I hear from the back seat, Are we there yet? You all can recognize that, can't you? I'll have to tell you, we're not there yet. It's a rhetorical question to ask. 
I worry about what the world will see in me as I stand as, I stand as an ambassador for him. In a dead and dying world. That's a scary, that's scary to me. We are all to be ambassadors. We heard that in our scripture reading this morning. Ambassadors? What's an ambassador? We represent the king of heaven to the world with a message that he's coming very soon. The message could not be plainer. Heaven is hurting now as we speak. Holy angels must be astonished at our apathy and lack of enthusiasm. You know, all heaven is a stir. There are angels coming back and forth to earth they are on their missions of mercy. They are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to us who would be heirs of salvation. All heaven is a stir. The world is in great turmoil. And God's people maybe could be asleep. Is that possible? We're talking Laodicea here. Rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Kind of, uh, you know, this way. But we should take courage. It will not always be this way. Caleb and Joshua, they stand forth as a tremendous examples in the Old Testament. They gave a good report that day. We are well able. We need to wash our ears and our eyes with their, with their, with their message. The walls came, did come tumbling down, right? Yeah. And the giants were slain. Our motivation should be enthusiastic, but it should be for Jesus' sake, for the sake of him. We'll never have that kind of revival until we really put our sympathy with him who has suffered and died for us. We should long for the advent in order to ease the pain and suffering of the one who brought salvation to light through the gospel. We should long for the advent in order for Jesus to be able to soon see the pleasure of the whole family in heaven and the family on earth being united again. Yes, it will be, it will happen. The Bible says he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Can you see the tears of Jesus as he sees the family of heaven put together again, including the human family? I know that we, I know that we know these things, and maybe I'm being a little bit too pessimistic here about our spiritual status quo. But the biggest evidence that still, still, the Laodicean message still is needed is because we're still here. The now is still here. We're not yet in the not yet, right? And uh, we must not blame the General Conference for this. We must not blame the North American Division or the, or the Pacific Union or the Arizona Conference. We don't want to blame them. We're the ones that we are all as an unclean thing. You know the Holy Prophet said that, Isaiah, but we are all as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousnesses are what? Filthy rags. The Holy Prophet said that. And uh, so, <clears throat> Who was that prophet, by the way, that made that comment? Isaiah. What can I say today that would be meaningful and helpful? Somewhere, sometime, there will be another Pentecost. It's coming. And it will come with latter rain power. This time when it happens, like it did in 31 AD, great events will result Powerful, heart-rending truth will be proclaimed with loud cry power. Miracles will be brought. Sick will be healed. Great victories will occur in reaching people for God. But before that can happen, there will be a great victories in our experience as we receive the benefits of imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness and sanctification and new birth. Somewhere we're going to need to come into great sympathy with Jesus and cooperate with him. You know, anciently, the people on the Day of Atonement were gathered around the sanctuary and they were cooperating with their high priest who was ready to go in before God for them. 
We're in that situation now in Earth's history, Day of Atonement style. We sense that the world will be ripe for har is ripe for harvest. We sense that, and we sense that there will be, will at one day be a complete fulfillment of Revelation 13 and 14. The question worth while pondering is, why do the angels of Revelation 7 continue to hold the winds? Things haven't, everything hasn't broken loose yet, has it? <clears throat> and what is the reason why they hold the winds? Because God's servants are not yet sealed in their foreheads with latter rain power. We know that when the next Pentecost comes, the second coming will not be very far behind. I'd like to read, have you visit, turn with me to John. John chapter 3. This is that night visit that <clears throat> Nicodemus made with our Lord. John chapter 3. I'd like to read verses 1 to 5. John chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> Why do you suppose he came at night? He was a Jewish rabbi. He wanted, didn't want anybody to see him there in company with Jesus. It says, therefore, this is verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent from God, and no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Jesus changed the subject real quickly. Jesus answered and said to him, Very, verily, I say to you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the, the second time into, the mother, into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus cut to the, twi to the chase there, didn't he? So when the wind blows... The curtains shake, right? Have you ever had an open window and the curtains are going like this? When the wind blows, the curtains shake. But does, does not therefore follow that if I shake the curtains that the wind is blowing. This is what we need every day. I sense very much good in our church. I sense a lot of good in this church. I've never seen a church with so much activity. But sometimes maybe the curtains are, are moving because we're moving them and not because of Holy Spirit wind. Could be, could, could happen, couldn't it? Much good in the church, weak and feeble as we are. I sense great truths. I also sense a shaking in the curtains, but I have not yet sensed the winds of the approaching Pentecost. It's worth noting the disciples did nothing to bring Pentecost on. They did not force Pentecost. They sought forgiveness and righteousness with God and in Christ. That's what Paul calls justification. We do not receive the Holy Spirit by human activity. That was the Galatian heresy. Our shaking of the curtains won't quite do it no matter how much activity takes place. Instead, they engaged in deep repentance, reconciled with each other, talked much about the Lord whom they loved and about the plan of salvation. That's what they spent their time doing for 10 days, which had been carefully and, and, they, and whom they loved and, and, the, and about the plan of salvation, which had been carefully laid since the foundation of the world. Sometimes we major on minors, maybe, and minor on majors. There can be side issues that we maybe major on too much. In the lingering afterglow of Calvary, there was a great explosion. The disciples saw themselves and their motives, and walls came tumbling down, and the giants were slain as they surveyed the atonement as they began to think about the cross and what Jesus had actually come, that God himself had come to visit this planet and that he had provided salvation full and free for 60 centuries of earth people. 
the egotism and dissension which turned to cowardice the night that Jesus was taken prisoner was gone. They saw themselves and they looked at the cross, all, all of it in a very, very new light. Ten days of that was all that heaven itself could endure without responding. And the response came, and what a response it was. The upper room was filled with the mighty Holy Spirit wind, and the curtain shook. Let's read about it in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. It says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat on each, upon each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 6. Now when the, this was noise abroad, the multitude came together. They were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. That's what the gift of tongues was for. To spread the gospel to the world who did not understand in their language. The same energy that created the world, that created the world now, this energized these human vessels so that they carried the gospel to, to the whole world in one generation. We do not manipulate such power. In fact, we can't even understand such power. Such is the fruit of taking the gospel of Jesus very seriously. We can only see the results and what it brought in the first century and follow the same course which they followed. When we recognize that the holy law's purpose is to, what? to, to, to lead us to Jesus, not to make us righteous. and take up the cross and follow him. And we, then we will fully come into sympathy with him. The desire to serve will come as fruit of the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts. It'll be automatic. It'll be the miracle of grace, Jim. A miracle of grace. It will be innocent obedience God wants to instill within us no self-involved motives, but rather this is what the message of Christ's righteousness does. It, it causes fruit to come into the life. It so causes the heart to soften toward God. We need soft hearts toward God. A false gospel don't work here. Let's spend our days searching for the cross as we, as we spend time in the word and prayer for the Holy Spirit. Praying for the former rain, that it might do its work, so the latter rain can bring seed to perfection. So that the gospel can go to the world with power. The Puritan pastor. He went down to the ship with, with his congregation. His little flock. And those people boarded a ship for the new world. A long voyage. They had a prayer meeting that day down by the beach. And in the farewell, the pastor said, I may not see you again. And his words were prophetic because people died on that, on that long, dangerous voyage to the new world. The trip was cold and it was wet and it was unstable and it was foggy and it was treacherous. So on the break, on the beach there, he pled with them to follow his teaching only in so far as it meshed with the scripture, agreed with scripture and Bible truth. And he said to them, if new light comes from the scriptures, believe it. He's literally telling them, I, didn't, I don't have all the truth, but new light will come. Believe it. Spend time with it. He told them that the jewels and the ornaments that the saints wear is the Ten Commandments. Let's say that again. This is one of a direct quote from, from him. He told them that the jewels and the ornaments that the saints wear are the Ten Commandments. Beautiful characters that come as we begin to learn to love God's laws like David, like, uh, David did. Today is a high Sabbath. We want to remember again the passion of Jesus for us 
and do it in communion with him. You think Jesus has passion for us? Oh, my goodness. If we could just see. It's our justification. And a sanctified people is the result. Whom he justifies, he also sanctifies and makes them holy and ready for his coming. Lord, help us remember again our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, he likes us. I'll say it a little stronger. He loves every one of us. Jesus came into an existence when he came here that he never knew before. There was never a being like this on the, on the, in the history of the universe as when Jesus came here, the God of heaven, and became one of us. Cold and uninviting. It was midnight darkness spiritually for the world. Romans were ruling the country. And uh, it was uh, not good. Midnight darkness spiritually in that first century generation. And even worse, he came to his own. And what does the Bible say about that? His own received him not. And the prophet Zechariah prophesying this uh, four or five hundred years before, he said, I was wounded in the house of my enemies. No, that's not what he said, right? I was wounded in the, ho in the house of my what? Friends. He was wounded in the house of his friends. Yes, that's Jesus. He's still pleading for us. And I want to emphasize that idea for us. What he does in heaven is for us. That's what it says in Hebrews 9.24. In spite of all, still loving us today. May we all, as we go into a new and uncertain week, may we all today find a resting place in him as we do what he has asked us to do. He said, do this in remembrance of me. This service uh, applies to all aspects of our lives. First of all, we see his servanthood. They had been on a journey that day. This was on a Thursday evening. They met together. The next day, he would be crucified. But they met here on this Thursday evening. The basin and the towel. He was indeed the servant of all of our necessities. He's the author of all true servanthood. Then his broken body beaten to the bone until the blood flowed, the cruel nails in his hands, the inability to breathe. Anybody here ever have a loss of breath? Some of you may be asthmatics. Maybe you've been in the emergency room, not able to breathe. Jesus went through that agony on the cross. Uh, the nails hurt so bad, his feet. And he tried to stand up so he could inspire air. The pain was so great. But you know what? Most of all, the guilt and grief of 60 centuries of us. That's what caused his death. That's what caused his pain. It was mental anguish because people broke his heart. And he dies as our substitute and our surety. Our salvation is sure, it's on a firm footing because somebody loved us so much that he would leave the courts of heaven, the adoration of all the angels and come here and go lower and lower until there was not a lower place for him to go. Born in a manger. This act of love fulfills the whole law. He was obedient, the Bible says, even unto death, the death of the cross. Obedient to his covenant promise, he promised to forgive every repentant sinner. That was his promise to us, and he fulfilled that promise to the letter. He was abundantly truthful. He never lies. He loves us enough to impute all his righteousness to us in justification. His perfect righteousness he applies to us. He looks at us when we give our hearts to him as though we had never ever sinned. Anybody here deserve that? That's how he looks at us, every believer in Jesus, even though we are not yet perfect. 
Justified believers. Do you know justified believers will go to heaven? How come? Because of Christ's righteousness. Some of you know about 1888. It was a wonderful message. Came to this, this people about Christ's righteousness. And I have to tell you, we need to be on that same page again. All of his perfection credited to us as though we had lived like he lived and we had spoke as he spoke. One of the reformers said that. They got that pretty well. And then the wine, the grape juice, the blood of Jesus, which takes away the sins of the world. And even today in the sanctuary above, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 that he ministers with his own blood. I don't know too much about what that means, except that the principle of the cross is applied to us as we pray and as we turn our hearts toward him. He ministers to us every day the benefits of what he wrought out on the cross, the principle of the blood. And uh, that's ours by empirical reality. He takes those sins of ours to his sanctuary above where in the final atonement he blots them out. The sins of every true believer is placed on the head of the scapegoat and then he will seal them and then the great time of trouble will come that will create a faith that will not die. This will allow people, earth people, to look up into the sky and say, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. While the world will scramble, those who are not forgiven, those who have not sought forgiveness, will scramble and call upon the rocks and mountains to fall upon them. So these are things that are ahead. Ready for translation? These are the themes that I love to dwell on. Ready for Jesus to come. Ready to go home with him. You know, in the Adventist church, we uh, have what we call communion service. Once every three months, once every quarter. Not so often that we... Uh, make it commonplace, and yet often enough that we don't forget. He said, this do in what? Remembrance. remembrance of me. It's kind of like the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep. This do in remembrance of me. The Bible has several things that we should remember, and this is one of them. And so uh, Jesus took a basin and a towel, and you can read about this in uh, John, the 13th chapter. In John 13, three times he says we ought to do this. Did you know that the first century Christians were, were known as the people who washed each other's feet? Why did they do that? You know, pride was the beginning of the whole fall, wasn't it? And this is humility. Jesus is, should I say this? Somebody took me at the door one day in Idaho and said, why did you say that? And what I said was that God, that Jesus, is the most humble being in all the universe. Think that's true? Was there any pride in him? No, he did something, he did the unthinkable. The angels, they must have looked at this in huge awe. And, and, and they weren't really expecting maybe what they saw. What an idea. And uh, so, He's the servant of all of, our, all of our necessities. He's wounded for our transgressions. He's wounded for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. And uh, so with his stripes, we are healed. 